Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jennifer Lezak, Coordinator of Special Projects with the Adult Services Department. And on behalf of everyone at the Chicago Public Library, welcome. Tonight's program is part of the 2020 One Book, One Chicago season, exploring the theme Beyond Borders and the book Exit West by Mohsen Hamid. For more information on other virtual programs, including book discussions, author events, workshops, and more, visit OneBookOneChicago.org. I especially encourage you to save the date for Overlooked Landmarks of Polish Chicago on October 21st. Again, details on the website. Thanks to the Chicago Public Library Foundation, Bank of America, Union Pacific, and United Airlines for their support in making this season of One Book, One Chicago possible. This program is sponsored by CPL's Polish Heritage Committee and presented in honor of Polish Heritage Month, which starts today. Our thanks to the librarians on that committee for their support in making tonight's event happen. During tonight's program, we'll be monitoring the chat for questions from the audience for our Q&A following the conversation, so please feel free to ask one. Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome Chicago author Dominic Pasiga. Dominic A. Pasiga is Professor Emeritus of History in the Department of Humanities, History, and Social Sciences at Columbia College, Chicago. An award-winning historian, his books include Polish Immigrants and Industrial Chicago, Workers on the South Side, 1880 to 1922, Chicago, a Biography, and Slaughterhouse, Chicago's Union Stockyard and the World It Made, all from the University of Chicago Press. In his latest book, American Warsaw, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of Polish Chicago, Pasika chronicles more than a century of immigration and later emigration back to Poland, showing how the community has continually redefined what it means to be Polish in Chicago. The interview will be conducted by local author and history expert, Daniel Pogoszelski. Sorry, Daniel, I tried. Thanks, Daniel, for being here tonight. Again, following the presentation, we'll have a chance to ask Dominic questions, so please leave your questions in the chat, which I'll be monitoring. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome Dominic and Daniel. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Welcome everybody. It's a it's a pleasure to be here in everyone's presence, especially in the you could say the one of the foremost voices of Chicago, Dominic Pasiga. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we can make it <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, when it, when we're talking about uh, the topic of of Chicago, Poland, uh, that nexus. There is no better expert than Dominic Basiga, somebody who not only was a professor, but also a Fulbright scholar in Poland's oldest university, the Jagiellonian University in, in Krakow. So without further ado, Professor, uh, I guess we should get started with the program. Let's um, do it. The first, <laughs> the first question I'd like to ask would be, Professor, this book is not just the result of a lifetime of study. This is a history that you lived. It touches on some of the most personal issues you can write about, which are who you are and where you came from. Did that at all affect the way you approached writing American Warsaw? You know, Dan, I, of course, I grew up in Polonia, uh, in the Polish community. I grew up in back of the yards on the south side of Chicago, a, a sometimes ignored part of Polonia. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess it did. Uh, you know, I've written several books about Chicago, and uh, two of them particularly on the Polish community. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, I, I often think about, when I was writing this book, I was often thinking about uh, my experience as a young man, as a young boy, uh, and how my world centered around my grandmother's kitchen, my babka's kuchnia, you know. It was her green kitchen that seemed to be Poland in the United States for me. Uh, we always spoke Polish in that kitchen. Uh, we, uh, there were Polish newspapers, there were, uh, I, I remember, and some of us who are a little bit older might remember uh, Marysia Data on the radio and her yodel in the morning. I would be sleeping and I would hear that yodel come out, you know, and, um, <laughs> uh, and he would wake me up to go to mass. Uh, I was an altar boy at the time. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think it did, and, and just knowing po older Polish people, I mean, when I grew up in Back of the Yards, I was born in 1949, when I grew up in Back of the Yards, there were still people who were there who um, who knew Upton Sinclair when he wrote The Jungle, uh, or didn't know Upton Sinclair, but was, were there at the time that Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle. So it, it, was, uh, it was part of my own uh, growing up experience. 
Wow. And, you know, later um, on, I worked with Bush, uh, National Alliance and Al Majewski and, and did a few things there. Yeah. Uh, you know, your allusion to uh, the kitchen reminds me very much of uh, Polish-American author John Goslowski, who, when asked what dialect of Polish he speaks, he says, ah, oh, you know, I don't speak the formal Polish. I speak kitchen Polish. Mm. Uh, so it, it definitely kind of reminds me of that. And that alludes to the second question I have, which is the word polskość, which translates to English as Polish. It's such mm. an emotionally perished word. And it means different things to different people. So how do you reconcile this in your work? Well, maybe we could go to the slide that says Polskosz, Janet. Um, Polskosz <laughs> yeah, is a, uh, uh, a feeling. Uh, you know, the, the big question is, uh, who is a Pole? What role does a Polish-American play? What, re what role do Poles and... I mean, Poland was a very large multi-ethnic country when it, before it was divided by the three uh, partitioned power, partitioning powers. There were Ukrainians and Assyrians and Romanians and Czechs and Poles. And, and of course, it was the largest Jewish country in the world uh, until 1939 <clears throat> when the Holocaust began. But, you know, I mean, so it was a very multi-ethnic country. And uh, what does it mean to be a Pole? How does one define oneself as a Pole? The Polish Roman Catholic Union in the United States said you had to be Catholic and speak Polish. The Polish National Alliance said all you had to do was believe in Poland. Uh, that's a big difference. There's an ideological difference that actually pulled the, the, the communities apart uh, for a good long time, as you well know. So, you know, Polskosz, what it meant to me was that there was this identity of being Polish-American, of, of, of having, you know, we say in, in Polish, dwie um, ojczyzny uh, jedna serca. You know, two, two, two fatherlands, one heart. And I think that's what a lot of us felt uh, growing up in those neighborhoods, that we were, you know, not disloyal to either one, but loyal to both. How can I put it more uh, succinctly? I'm not sure. But I think it was an important part of our, our feeling. Polskość meant you went to, well, in my case, I went to a Polish uh, parochial school. Polish American Parochial School, Sacred Heart, and 46th and Walcott. Um, I took part in various PNA events. Uh, I'm a Gural. I don't know if you, our, our audience knows what a Gural is, but I'm a Polish Highlander. These are the slide shows Polish Highlanders walking down the street, not far from my uh, grandmother's house, in fact, uh, just down the block. <laughs> and so, you know, we have this whole idea of of Polskość, what it means to be Polish uh, in, in America. And this was a big thing in the 19th century, as you well know, I, uh, because in the 19th century, you had to decide, or you had to at least have some sort of feeling of connectedness with Poland and the United States. If we can go to the slide on, um, on uh, the uh, Col uh, Colombian Exposition, you know, if we can do that. And in the Colombian Exposition in 1893, there was no political Poland. Uh, there was a cultural Poland, but there was no political Poland. But in 1893, so, so Poland was not represented at the Columbian Exposition, except by Polish Chicagoans, who helped to erect uh, this small picture here on the, um, I guess the right, uh, in the oval, is the uh, Polish uh, restaurant. It was the only Polish building at the exposition. They held lots of, uh, of, of demonstrations and, uh, and celebrations at the, at the hall on, on, in the other photograph, but it was the idea here was how do Poles express themselves as a nation when they're not represented politically? But there was a Polish day, as there was a Czech day and an Irish day, and neither one of those countries existed technically uh, at the time, because Poles were becoming more and more of a political force in the city of Chicago, so they could exert themselves. The following year, if we can go to the next slide of the Lvov Provincial Fair, uh, the Lviv Provincial Fair in 1894, the following year, Polish Chicagoans helped to organize a, a nationwide attempt to create a American exhibit at, in Lviv, which was in, uh, is now in the Ukraine, but was considered to be part of Poland at the time. It was largely a Polish and Jewish city uh, at the time. And uh, they set up this, this Victorian house, this Queen Anne style, I guess, house, uh, and, and filled it with um, mementos of Polish organizations in the United States. Why? Because the Poles in Chicago wanted to tell Poles in Poland 
that they were still part of the country, that they were still uh, happily uh, organizing for Polish independence. We considered ourselves to be the fourth partition. Poland had been divided in three partitions in the 18th century. And in the 19th century, the diaspora was considered a fourth partition. And what could the fourth partition do to help Poland become independent? Well, it could send money and it could send boys, blood, uh, to fight. Uh, and it did both in World War, uh, World War I. Can we go to the World War I exam uh, slide now? Yeah. So if we go to the World War I slide, you have to understand that World War I, when it broke up, broke out, was an intensely Polskosh event, a very Polish event for Chicago. Um, American Poles raised an army of some 30,000 men to fight on the Western Front to fight against the Germans. And that army, which we call the Blue Army, or uh, uh, the Blue Army, which went to Poland uh, after the fighting stopped in the West. Poland, remember, World War I for Poland did not end until 1921 with the uh, uh, Treaty of Riga. So these were Polish-American kids who fought in the Polish army. And by the way, uh, Polish-Americans fought in very large numbers in the American army also. So there was this great patriotic kind of um, uh, movement to try to uh, uh, defend the United States and also to regain independence for Poland. Uh, maybe if we can go to Polish relief, the next slide. Polish relief was very important because what Chicago did was it organized millions of dollars were sent to Poland to help. You know, we think about the Western Front in the United States, you know, the front in France and Belgium and so forth, Germany. Uh, but the World War I was fought largely in the East, and guess where that front was? It was in the middle of Poland. So Poland was devastated by the war, and Poles were on the verge of great famine in 1918. Uh, even though they celebrated their independence on November 11th, 1918, on Armistice Day, uh, they faced great famine. So Polish Americans were sending money to try to feed Polish children. The Gray Samaritans, a, a group of young women from uh, Chicago and other Polonia centers, went to Poland to uh, to uh, uh, help uh, feed children, take care of children uh, at the time who were who were on the verge of starving. Uh, in uh, in Poland itself after the war. So this idea of Polskosz was deeply connected to both an American patriotism and to a Polish patriotism. Two fatherlands, one heart. Beautifully, beautifully put. Uh, with regards to the Blue Army, Haller's Army, uh, I myself remember as a, as a young kid in front of St. Hyacinth where there is a monument that is in front of the church that actually General Haller himself came back in 1923, I believe, to dedicate and talks about how from that one parish, nearly 500 mm -hmm. young men fought in the First mm -hmm. World War, most of them in Haller's army. So well, it's St. Peter's Costco, over 800 fought in World War One. So it's a, there's a plaque on the side of St. Stanislaus Koska Church on, what is it, Noble and Evergreen, right about there. Yeah. yeah. The heart of Kostkaville. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to before the city was even formally incorporated, Chicago, as you mentioned, played a key role in Poland's many struggles for independence. Now, one, here's a question. Do you think that one could make the argument that there wouldn't be an independent Poland today without the aid of Chicagoans? Well, I think there probably wouldn't. I, I, it would be an independent Poland today without the aid of Americans, of Polish Americans, uh, with Chicago as the capital. So it was the major organizing center uh, for that uh, effort, uh, raising money, raising troops. And by the way, every time Poland was in trouble, the Chicago Polonia stood up and worked for it. Um, you know, Polonia in the 1920s and 1930s kind of separated itself from Poland. Uh, we became more American in many ways. Um, but in the, by the end of the 1930s, Poland was again under duress, right? If we can see the World War II slide, um, uh, Poland was again under duress. It was the first to fight uh, uh, against the Nazis on September 1st, 1939. Um, and, uh, and Chicago, Polonia, once this time did not raise an army. 
but it raised millions of dollars to be sent to Poland for relief efforts to try to help Poland, which was uh, struggling under Nazi domination. So, you know, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of uh, uh, that kind of, uh, of, of thing going. So, yeah, so the World War II was fought both in the military. The young man there is dressed, by the way, in a, in a United States uh, cavalry uniform. Uh, he actually fought on horseback at the beginning, not didn't fight, but was trained to fight on horseback. Uh, and then they turned into an armor uh, uh, division. And the young women here are all some of the first union members of the United Packing House workers in, uh, at the Armour and Company. They worked in the canning department. So the war was fought at home, largely, uh, by many uh, Polish Americans who worked in steel mills and packing houses and the Ford plant in Detroit, et cetera, uh, and the Ford plant in Chicago, as well as on the Western Front in the American Army. And a great deal of money was sent to try to help Poland. And, and, you know, even after the war, we were sending, I remember very much in my grandmother's kitchen once again, uh, the sending of uh, packages for relief. You know, uh, cod liver oil, good God, cod liver oil uh, was in demand in Poland uh, at the time. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it, uh, it, it, it was uh, an interesting time. And... Um, uh, but every time, and then later on, when the Solidarity Movement took part, uh, the Chicago Polonia again sort of stood up and said, and and sent money and 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 food and clothing and medicine to Poland in an attempt to help Solidarity. That was led largely uh, by the Polish National Alliance, the Polish American Congress, um, people like Al Majewski, people like uh, 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 Alderman Puczynski, etc. Yeah. My father actually was even himself involved uh, just in a grassroots organization called POMOS with regards to trying to get mm -hmm. contraband literature, everything from books like 1984 to the latest news and self-printed news uh, newsletters back to the motherland. Mm -hmm. So speaking of uh, Polishness, you know, Chicago is often referred to as a city of neighborhoods. But mm -hmm. for much of its history, it was more like a city of ethnic enclaves. So how does this affect the understanding of what it means to be Polish for the many Polsky folk who, like you and I, live up in the Windy City? Well, I, I think if, if we can get the slide up that says uh, um, parish equals community, uh, the Polish neighborhoods were, were largely uh, centered around the idea of the Catholic Church, or later on in some neighborhoods, the Polish National Catholic Church, which evolved after about 1905. Uh, but, uh, you know, the idea here was to, to, that, that family. So go to the slide with family. Uh, the, the family was one of the most important institutions to be protected. So in the great immigration, I remember there are about three or four major immigrations from Poland. Uh, this, these slides represent the Zahlebem migration. That is the migration for bread, largely from about 1850 to about 1925. This was the big migration that shaped Polonia in the United States. Um, when that happened, uh, the idea here that they came to a foreign place, to a place that was not welcoming in many ways to Polish culture, Polish religion, Polish institutions, to Polish traditions. How do you protect the family? Well, you protect the family by protecting the children. So if we can go to the slide that says some 60 Polish parishes and schools, uh, the idea here was to create a parish uh, and then to create a, a parochial school. And, uh, and there are some 60 of these Chicago parishes that uh, are today uh, part of, uh, of, of or, or, or are part of the Polonia tradition. Many of them have been closed, actually. Uh, by the way, that's my parish in the lower right-hand corner, Sacred Heart. That's the founding of the Polish Highlanders Alliance uh, 90 years ago uh, in that parish. So the idea here was that parish was going to be, be sort of a, 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 a basis for it. If we can go to the next slide, which is uh, Polish businesses, uh, and then immediately Polish businesses evolved. And the most important Polish business in many ways was the next slide, which is the, the Polish saloon. 
Now, saloons were not only places to get drunk, they were places to meet people, to talk politics, to talk labor union, actually to organize parishes. Uh, uh, if you had a baptism, the back room of the uh, parish was a play of, I'm sorry, of the saloon was a place to have a, a, a party. Uh, you, later, you'd have a funeral dinner there, or you'd have a wedding celebration there. So the saloon was very important. So the neighborhood I grew up in, back of the yards, had one saloon for every 43 registered voters. There were three saloons per block. Now, this was a very integrated area. So you have to understand about these neighborhoods. None of, none of them were all Polish. Uh, they were mixed. So they were what we call spatial integration, social segregation. So spatially, they were integrated. You might live in a, a tenement. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, behind you might live a Lithuanian family. Next door might be an Irish family. Down the block might be a Czech family or a German family. But you all went to separate institutions. So you were spatially integrated but socially segregated. Polish taverns, German taverns, Lithuanian taverns, etc. cetera. Uh, only taverns that were on major streets greeted everybody, you know, sort of like 47th Street or Milwaukee Avenue, et cetera. So in 1916, there's an article in the Jennings Junskowa, the Polish newspaper, about Polish taverns. And it said that a, a German, a drunken German, had walked into a Polish tavern in back of the yards. And an amazing miracle had happened. A bottle came to life, jumped down from the shelf, hit him in the head, and carried him out and threw him into the street. Then he jumped, then the bottle came back into the tavern and jumped up on the shelf again and turned back into just a simple bottle. And there were 40 people who'd swore that this happened to the police. And at the bottom of the article in Jennings and Scove, it said, Germans, drink in your own taverns. So there was a lesson to be learned. So some of these taverns, I mean, pity the poor, pity the poor Pole who walked into a Lithuanian tavern or into a German tavern or into an Irish tavern, unless it was on the major streets where everybody was greeted. But the saloon was really important as a place to organize uh, and to organize the sense of community. So these were all very important, but the idea was to create a cradle to grave institution. So you had things like, well, let's go to St. Mary's Nazareth Hospital uh, slide. You had hospitals. And of course, the next slide on, on cemeteries, you had cemeteries. So you were, you were taken care of in the neighborhood from cradle to grave. Um, no Polish American at the time. Uh, would conceive of going to a non-Polish undertaker, right? I mean, you really need somebody who spoke Polish to talk to God because God spoke Polish only, right? He didn't speak Irish or German or Lithuanian. He spoke Polish. So you had this undertaker who would take you to the Polish church and take you to the Polish cemetery, uh, and, and you'd have your, your peace. So there's two major Polish cemeteries in Chicago, St. Adelbert's on the north side and Resurrection Cemetery on the south side. And most people talk about Resurrection Cemetery when they talk about Resurrection Mary, but that's really a, a, a silly story on the side. It's an important institution for Polonia as a whole. Okay, so the whole idea of Polskość and and culture and community intermixed with each other to create a very strong, and uh, actually at one time a, a fairly politically strong community uh, in the city of Chicago. You know, Dominic, uh, when folks from Poland will ask me what part of Poland I'm from, given the fact that I grew up here, I'll just tell folks, jestem chłopak um, which means I'm just a boy from around St. Hyacinth Parish. So you yeah. definitely hit the nail on the head with that. <laughs> sure. Um, for so long, as you mentioned, Chicago was the capital of Polish mm -hmm. America. Our famous, you know, think about this, is that in Chicago, you didn't just have a Polish village, a pole town, a little Warsaw, you had a Polish downtown. It's a unique uh, title, right? It's you have downtown and then you have the Polish downtown. And it, it shows the scope of the Polish community and its meaning here in the United States. But in Poland today, the special relationship between Chicago and uh, Poland has been largely forgotten. And there's certainly less interest on the topic of Chicago among the, the youngest generation of Poles. And you think to yourself, what a change this is from the time of Pope John Paul II, who made a political statement when he was, when the communist authorities didn't want to let him into Poland. He's like, well, I know a way to talk to the Polish people without going to Poland. I'll go to Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, one time where the second city was first. So why do you think that there's been this change? 
I, well, I think there's, there's two things that have happened. One, of course, the communist government was done away with. Um, and uh, so, and, and it was done away with largely by, once again, by, uh, not largely, but in part by support from Polish Chicago and Polish America. Uh, but also, uh, once Poland became, let's call it, a, uh, I remember a poll telling me we just want to be a normal European country. Uh, and that's exactly what they became. They became a normal European country. Well, what does that mean? They joined the EU. So now there are 13 buses every day from Poznań to Brussels. You can go to Brussels and get a job. You can go to Italy and get a job. You can go to Northern France and get a job. When I was in Sicily uh, visiting uh, my wife's relatives, uh, I, I was told there were 50,000 Poles in Sicily. I was sitting in a, in a, um, in a, in a, in a town square having a, a cup of a uh, glass of wine uh, and suddenly I heard Polish all around me. There were all these Poles <laughs> around me. And I says, so I started talking to them and, you know, they said, yes, we're here on vacation. Uh, we don't, ha you know, you don't need a visa to go to Italy. You know, there's plenty of jobs, et cetera. So if you work in Brussels or you work in Sicily or you work in Germany or France, it's a lot easier to go home for Easter. It's a lot easier to go home for Christmas. So the, the economic draw to Chicago became less. The other th reason, of course, is that we've lost more industrial jobs in Chicago in the last 50 years than some countries had as a whole. As you know, our, 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 our uh, industrial uh, system, can we see the deindustrialization slide? Uh, the deindustrialization of Chicago has just been uh, terrific. And uh, so in the stockyards, we lost some 20. This is a picture of an old packing house in Chicago. Um, there were about 2,000 people working in that building at one time. They're gone. We've lost 50,000 meatpacking jobs, over 50,000 steel jobs. These were jobs that drew immigrants to the city, drew Polish immigrants to the city. Now you have another uh, industrial base, another uh, chance for jobs in Western Europe. It's a lot easier. And, you know, I, I realize that the visa situation has changed, but uh, so has Poland. Poland has changed. And uh, the Polish economy is pretty decent. It's pretty good. It's growing. Uh, there's a lot of investment. I think that's all part of it. Also, the younger generation no longer sees America as this sort of magnet for them. But if we can go to uh, the slide that says uh, the ongoing connection, I think this is really important. Well, there was martial law. That was another uh, one. But the ongoing connection, this is a, a newspaper, Tygodnik uh from my part of Poland. I'm a good I'm a Polish mountaineer, Highlander. Uh, when I was in Zakopane, I bought a copy of the Tygodnik. The back <laughs> pages were filled with advertisements for real estate, lawyers, and uh, delicatessens on Archer Avenue in Chicago and in the southwest suburbs. So you still have this ongoing connection. There's still this connection that goes back and forth. Uh, those of us uh, uh, in, that belong to the Polish-American Historical Association and the Polish Institute of Arts and Sciences in America – go back and forth constantly. We have constant connection with Poland. It's a lot easier now, a lot easier than it was the first time I went to Poland in 1986. Uh, Poland is a normal European country. And so Chicago has lost its, its importance in some ways. Uh, but that's okay. It's important that Poland become a normal European country. And, you know, if we can go to the next slide, which is a suburban Polonia, uh, that's where Polonia is headed. And because of that, Dan, as you know, you're very involved in local politics. Because of that, Polonia has lost political clout in the city. When we all lived in a few wards in the northwest and the southwest and the southeast side, we had aldermen, we had congressmen, etc. When we all moved to the suburbs, we're in 300 or 400 different municipalities. We're split up, right? So the mayor of Justice, Illinois, is a Pole, is a Goodall, in fact, he's a mountaineer. But, uh, you know, does he have the clout that the mayor of the city of Chicago has? Probably not. So here is the question. Uh, you know, once one, one person came up to me and asked me, how can we save St. Adelbert's, Wojciechowa, and Pilsen? I said, very simple. Move back. 
move back and go to mass and put the dollar in the, bu- in, in the bucket every Sunday. And you'll save St. Adelbert's. But if you're not there, you're not going to do anything. So, I mean, we've dispersed across the way. Though, if we go to the next slide, there is still this ongoing, um, the, the what is it, uh, the Agora. If we can go to the Agora slide. Uh, there's still a an ongoing cultural connection between Chicago that has proved very important. Uh, the Sister Cities program, uh, you know, Warsaw was the first sister, sister city of Chicago, and that connection remains very important. Uh, the Sister Cities program, the Warsaw Sister Cities Committee, helped bring the uh, Agora here, this uh, monumental sculpture piece at the south end of, uh, of Grant Park by Magdalena Abakanovich. Uh, so there's still this constant connection between the two. And I think it's going to be an ongoing connection. It won't disappear. Um, but it's not as important as it once was when Poland. But should Poland again be under stress? Then the Chicago Polonia, whether it's suburban or urban, will come to Poland's assistance whenever it can. Very well said, Dominic. Um uh, well, I think that that wraps up our questions, but I believe that we're going to have some questions from the audience at this point. Great. We sure do. We have a lot of really great questions from the audience. So um, we'll start off with one. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, some who define Polish as Catholics and exclude the Jewish Poles even right. today in the U.S.? Sure. I mean, this has been an ongoing issue in Poland. As I mentioned, as I mentioned it's, it's an ongoing issue in Poland, and it's an ongoing issue here in the United States. Um, I tried to address it in my book. There has been, um, and I think we have to face, as, as, a, as a, Polish, uh, a Polish-American Catholic, you have to face the reality of, of anti-Semitism in the Polish community. You also have to face the reality that Poland was a multi-ethnic state. You know, the, the, the Pilsudski ideal was to bring all these people together under the Polish flag. Um, and that was great before the rise of nationalism. But after the rise of nationalism, you have an issue. You have um, Polish nationalism. You have Zionism, right? You have Ukrainian nationalism. You have Lithuanian nationalism. And the country sort of came apart. Today, Poland is a very singular country in many ways, about 95% Polish ethnic. Uh, groups in in the in the country, uh, but the Polish Jewish relationship has always been kind of, you know, this uh, there's this kind of a love hate relationship between the two groups uh, that I I, I am uh, sad about. Uh, they lived together for 800, 900 years. Um, they intermarried. Um, both groups say they didn't, but they both did. Uh, I have I believe some Jewish uh, ancestor. Um, and, and, and the fact is that these two groups lived together for a long time. Uh, they worked with each other. Um, you know, on 47th street and back of the yards, there were all the little stores were Polish Jews. When I would go into these stores, they would talk to me in Polish because they knew my grandmother. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it was just part of the community. So on a certain level, on a, on a, on a, on a let's say a peasant merchant, uh, how can I put it this way? On a one-to-one level, right? We were very friendly. But when it came to bigger political issues, then we started to argue with each other a little bit too much and uh, and went at each other. So uh, it, it, it is always a difficult issue. My book tries to deal with, with it in part, um, but there were um, problems on both sides. How... Um... We have a question that says, why didn't Polonia form any military formations in World War II as they did in World War I? Well, I'll, t- I'll tell you why. Um, in 1924, 1925, the immigration was basically cut off from Poland. We had various immigration laws. You know, there's a good deal of anti-immigrant feeling in the country. And, and, ver- and as we know, even in this current days, right, anti-immigrant feeling bubbles up and it bubbled up after World War I, especially. Uh, and immigration was cut off from Eastern and Southern Europe. So there wasn't this constant flow of Poles into the country. Uh, a lot of Poles who had moved here, uh, some went back, but the great majority stayed here. They had children here in Chicago and other places. Um, and they 
the kids began to identify more and more as 20s and early 30s as, as Americans. And so there was not this great sense of patriotism. Poland, they, 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 they paid in blood and, and treasure for World War I, and Poland received its independence. World War II, it was going to be just charitable uh, 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 demonstration. I mean, the Polish army came here to Canada and to the United States and tried to organize a large number of people. Um, and some went. I mean, I, I tell a story about a young boy in the in the uh, I forget his name now, unfortunately, a young boy who uh, at the age of 16 wanted to join the Air Force. They wouldn't let him. So he joined the Polish Air Force in in uh, in uh, exile and uh, lost both legs and an arm in, in as a tail gunner on a bomber on a, on a lacrosse bomber in the British, you know, Air Force, um, the British Polish Air Force. Um, came back and was treated as a hero here in Chicago. But uh, think about that. I mean, that was rare. I mean, my father served in World War II. He was a highly decorated soldier. Um, silver star, two bronze stars, two purple hearts. Uh, but he served in the American army because this was his country. Uh, and I think so that idea of Tolskosh had changed in the 20s and the 30s to, to a large extent. That's uh, really interesting. Um... We have another question that says, do you think that there's any chance of a fourth or fifth wave of Poles immigrating to Chicago? There's always a chance. Um, I think, you know, um, the last big migration was the solidarity migration, which Dan's father was part of. Um, and uh, I knew a lot of people in that migration. Uh, I was a young man when it began to happen. Um, will there be another one? It, it all depends. I mean... How attractive is Chicago and how attractive is Paris or Brussels or you know, unfortunately London was going to be cut off in a, by the end of this month. Uh, but, uh, you know, you take a bus and go to Rome. Uh, it's not a bad deal. So I, I don't know that that's going to, and uh, by the way, Poland is doing very well economically comparatively to uh, many other East European countries. Uh, so I don't see it immediately, but should something terrible happen and, and hopefully it will not, uh, then there might be another migration. Um, someone asks, uh, can Chicago still be considered the cultural capital of American Polonia? Maybe not Warsaw population-wise, but Krakow. Well, you know, I think what's happened with Chicago, of course, is, uh, young Poles, Poles who are better educated, um, who are looking for upward mobility or looking to other places. Uh, there's a large Polish migration in New York right now. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm talking about people living in Greenpoint. I'm talking about people living in Manhattan. Uh, there's a large Polish migration even to Florida uh, at this point. I'm just talking to several Poles who say, oh, yes, you got to go to Florida. That's where Polonia is. So uh, that's real weird to me, but okay. Um, <laughs> So, you know, it, it's, it, it all depends. Um, Chicago's still the capital. I'll tell you why Chicago's still the capital, because the Polish National Alliance is here. The Polish Roman Catholic Union is here. Uh, the major cultural institutions are here. But New York's not far behind with the Pilsudski Institute, the Kostuszka Foundation, and the Polish Institute of Arts and Sciences in America. Their headquarters are all in New York. So New York has kind of bypassed in some ways Chicago as a, as the, as the cultural center of, of the community. New York, always trying to take us down. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Jo Joanna asks, was it common in the early 1900s to travel back to Poland to bring your relatives? I know someone who claims that his grandfather brought his seven siblings to America one by one. Wow. Well, they wouldn't go back to Poland. They'd send money and a ship uh, ticket. Uh, that was the major way to go. It was not going back to Poland and you have to come back with them. I mean, right now you can get, you can be in Warsaw in 10 hours, right? You get on a plane in, at O'Hare and you can be in Warsaw in 10 hours. Um, and then turn of the century, it's 10 to 15 days and uh, it's expensive. And you're, once you get to Bremen, you got to take a train to Poland and then get down to the village, etc. So what you do is you send the ticket. And the tickets were really interesting because the tickets continue, were, were from, let's say, the little town of um, Szaflada in the Polish mountains to Chicago. So you'd have a ticket that would take you uh, from Krakow by train 
to the German border, then to Berlin, and then to Bremen, and then on a ship, and then to New York, and the ticket would be, and you would peel the parts of the tickets off, and then in New York, take a train to Chicago. And and the interesting thing about this is that this was very well planned out. You know, it was this is time before computers. There's time, you know people and people do get lost in some cases. You know, one of the problems with Chicago is if you're coming on the train from the East Coast, and uh, it's a big run at the stockyards, and you're stuck in Ohio for two days because there's a cattle hogs and sheep coming into Chicago, and immigrant trains are third class trains. They're not second class trains. Cattle trains are second class trains. So you're stuck in Ohio or God forbid, Pennsylvania, right? And then you get into the Chicago area and the first thing you hear is East Chicago, Indiana. You get off the train and you're in Indiana. You're not in Chicago. And then you hear, or if you stay on, you hear the next thing is South Chicago. You get off at the train at South Chicago in, in the city, but you're now you're looking for Milwaukee Avenue and it's a long way away. So uh, there were all kinds of these kinds of things that happened at the time. So, but basically, you sent the ticket. Uh, you, if you followed the ticket, you, you made it to Milwaukee Avenue or to 47th and Ashland or to South Chicago or Hegwish or, or to Pilsen, which was uh, a, a Polish and Czech community. And, um, and, and you work things out. But it, uh, so most people actually sent tickets back rather than going back to get them. Um, we have a question of, uh, is there any special relationship between Hungarians and Poles in Chicago? I don't know of any personal relationship in Chicago. In Europe, it's very close, of course. Hungarians and Poles see each other both as sort of this freedom fighting uh, group. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, the Poles were involved in the 1848 revolt in, in Hungary against the Austrians, etc., in Chicago, there weren't as many Hungarians as one might think, uh, though they did work with the Poles in the steel mills, primarily of South Chicago. Um, we have a question from a watcher who said that he's feeling sadness at Poland's sort of author authoritarian shift in recent times. Um, and yeah. it says, he says he's reminded it's very different from the Lech Walesa years, and uh, when he goes past that statue, he thinks about it, the statue that's at Northeastern Illinois University campus, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you have any thoughts on that? Well, you know, I think the current regime in Poland is problematic. Um, I also think the current regime in Washington, D.C. is problematic. Uh, there has been a general turn to the right uh, throughout these countries. Um, hopefully that will change someday soon. Uh, but it's not as tightly kept as it was under communism. I mean, I remember visiting Poland when it was still a communist country. And I think some of the things that are happening in Poland are bringing back those kinds of memories. Um, I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a, it's a sad situation in some ways, but it's also a situation that's caused by people that are afraid and frightened, right? People are frightened by change. I think that's happening here and it's happening there. People are frightened by, you know, I, 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 there are several kind of, I've taken cabs in Krakow, Krakow and in Warsaw, right? Krakow cab drivers are very quiet. They don't talk to you. In Warsaw, you get a political speech every time you get into a cab. They just talk and talk and talk about the regime or about the old regime or how good things were under communism or how bad things were under communism. If you get into two different cabs, you get two different stories. Uh, so, you know, politics and uh, culture are very much intertwined uh, in, in, in Poland. And, um, and uh, I think the last elections showed some kind of change probably on the horizon. We'll see. I feel like maybe cab drivers and their stories is going to be your next book. That sounds fascinating. <laughs> My <laughs> um, next book on Chicago politics, that's even worse. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, someone asked, how many Poles are working in Chicago but still have families in Poland? Are they here for economic reasons or will they return to Poland? And also, you know, can you talk a little bit about the immigration of Polish Chicagoans back to Poland to retire there in more recent years? Actually, you know, there's been a constant ebb and flow back and forth constantly throughout history. Um, and uh, and Dan will tell you, many of the people who lived in his old neighborhood, uh, St. Hyacinth's neighborhood, uh, around what, uh, Milwaukee and Central, 
Park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, most and many of those people were, on, were uh, as we used to say, on vacation. That is, they came illegally into the country on a vacation visa and then disappeared. I, I had someone working on my house a few years ago, and I said to him, how long have you been on vacation? He said, 26 years. He's been <laughs> working in Chicago. Um, during Then there was a sort of forgiveness of that a few years ago, and, and, and he was able to settle in. I, I think um, that people do go back and forth. I think a lot of people think about retiring in Poland. It's not as cheap as it used to be. It used to be a lot cheaper back in the 80s. If you came, first time I went to Poland, I was a what we call a Zwote millionaire. Zwote is the Polish dollar. I was a Zwote millionaire, which meant I had about $80 on me. It was uh, just a, kind of amazing. Um, and um, that has changed because it's become a modern European country. So it's a little more difficult to take your social security check and, and move some to some little village someplace. But it's it's still possible. People go back and forth. Um, some people go back and uh, find out they're not that happy because you know? they're now Americans, and it's different. Um, I knew people who went back to Poland. Everybody called them the American. So guess what they did? They came back to America, um, where they were called the, the Pole here, right? So it's 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 a, it's, it's a bifurcated kind of identity. Uh, but yeah, I, I think people do go back and forth. People mainly come here, or used to mainly come here for economic reasons, but also for some political and cultural reasons as well. Um, what parallels do you see between Polish immigrants over time and refugees uh, from Poland over time uh, to the immigrants and refugees that we see coming into America today from lots of different countries? Yes, I, I think they're very, very closely related. I think you have to understand when Poles came here, they weren't considered white. They weren't considered Americans. They were Protestant. This was a largely Protestant Anglo-Saxon country. Uh, there was a great deal of discrimination. There was a great deal of anti-immigrant feeling, uh, first against the Irish and Germans and later against the Poles and Hungarians and Slovaks. I know you're of Slovak descent. Jennifer. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. uh, which is almost just being like Polish. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so there was a right? <laughs> great deal of uh, of, of um, prejudice against these people. And eventually, as I told you, immigration was cut off by the anti-immigrant feeling. There was a feeling that these people were inferior. Look, they had names that could not be pronounced like Pogorzelski. Who the hell can pronounce that? Or, or Patsvida, my name is, that's how you say it in Polish. Um, or Litzak, right? How, how do you pronounce these names? How, you know, 17 vowel, vowel, vowels in a row. It just it makes no, no sense at all. And then they, 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 they went to mass and, and they prayed in Latin. That's totally bizarre for Protestants. Um, they were, uh, and, and let me, they, they were what the Germans would call untermensch, underhuman in many ways. And so there was a tremendous prejudice against them. And, uh, and there's a tremendous prejudice against the immigrants today. What, what bothers me about Polish Americans today, and I'll tell you this, uh, and I'm going to get a lot of hate mail for this, but a lot of Polish Americans sit back and say, these damn immigrants. Well, guess what? You were one of those damn immigrants once, and you were prejudiced against once, and, 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 and you had people who called you not, not a American, not able to even ever become American, or your children. Uh, and, and you just wonder, but Americans do this. This was the feeling against the Irish. This was the feeling against the, the, the Germans. This was the feeling against everybody. You know, um, the Germans who came to Pennsylvania before the revolution, there was this feeling like these aren't real Americans. They're not of English stock. They shouldn't be here. You know, and so there's this constant kind of angst in this country over immigration. And, uh, and I think the story that I tell in this book is also the story of people who are coming here today. Some of those people are Polish, but many of them are also now Mexican or Guatemalan or from El Salvador or from Africa or from the Middle East. And they're going through the same process. And this country is going through the same process again, because this is what we do. It's a, the reality of immigration, the, the fact people will say, you know, I often used to tell my students, raise your hand if you want to become a busboy. None of my students would raise their hand. How many of you want to work and clean up my yard? 
How many of you want to work at a packing house and stand their blood up to your ankles? Eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day. None of them would raise their hand. And yet we need people to do that, don't we? And that's what immigrants do. And then their children go to Yale and Harvard <laughs> and become well, Supreme Court justice. That leads me to kind of my, my last question, or my next question. I've got room for a couple more, but um, this is also maybe for Dan to weigh in on as well. But um, how do the next generation, how do you keep those cultural ties in your children or your grandchildren when they are really Americans and not Poles? And uh, also somebody asked, uh, do you think that given the difficulty for English speakers to pronounce Polish surnames, how prevalent is the loss of Polish surnames over time in America? So kind of similar, similar trains of thought there. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you a, a little story uh, and then Dan maybe can jump in. Um, I grew up in back of the yards and I pronounced my last name Patsiga and everybody in the back of the yards, even the, the Mexican and Irish kids could say Patsiga. Right, because I was everybody in back of the yards knew me as Patsiga. Um, I went to De La Salle High School, in 35th in Michigan. Five mayors went to De La Salle and me. Okay, I'm the more important one. <laughs> That's a joke. Um, and nobody could pronounce my name. I was called Paycheck, Pakuga, Pakaya, Pataka. It was just just a mess. So we finally settled on Pasiga. I think my senior year. Um, so yeah, it, it, that that's part of the problem. How did now that how did I keep my connection? Well, my it was my grandmother was had died before I was born, and we probably would not have that connection. I think in my cousins, most of them don't speak much Polish except for a couple of words, you know. Uh, but I was basically in two places much of my early life: my grandmother's house and my mother's house. That so we spoke Polish. I think my own daughters are now of Sicilian and Polish descent. And one of them has gone to Poland twice to learn a little bit of Polish. And she does, I think, reasonably well. Um, I think that uh, uh, there's always been this feeling my wife and I both have felt that they both should go to the places where we came from so that they know their roots. I worry about Americans who don't know their roots. They don't know where they're from. You know, I'll ask a kid, what's your ethnicity? And you say, oh, I'm a mongrel. No, you're not. You know, you're not a mongrel. You're from someplace. You know something. Uh, oh, yeah, well, my grandfather was from Poland, my grandmother was from Ireland. You know, well, great. So let's talk about that. Um, I think that was that's really important because we all come from someplace. And if we know that, if we understand that, then we don't have the prejudice against immigrants that we have because we all came from someplace. I don't care if your name is Richard Wadsward Wellington III and you came on the Mayflower, you're still an immigrant. Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the daughters of the American Revolution in the 1930s, and she, they, they were a rather anti-immigrant group. And they said, um, and he, he, he greeted them by saying, my fellow immigrants. Think about that, my fellow immigrants. Franklin Roosevelt was from a Dutch family that was here from like 1640 on. He said, <laughs> my fellow immigrants. Uh, when my daughter won an award from the daughters of the American Revolution for an essay, someone asked me, oh, when did I get here? And I, you know, we're, Yes, some sort of connection to the Mayflower. And I said, no, I'm from 47th Street. Uh, 47th Street to me is my identity, you know, uh, a long time ago. It's, it's you know, I, I'm, a, I'm 102 years old now. But any, anyway, or something like that. Uh, but, but the idea here is that we're all from someplace else. And I think it's really important for kids, young adults, to know where they came from. So I've tried to do that with my daughters. We, we've been to the towns in Italy that my wife's family's from. We've been to the towns in Poland where I'm from and uh, or my family's from. Uh, and we've maintained that kind of connection. And uh, I think it's important for self-identity, for self-knowledge. Uh, think about how important, art, uh, and what is, I want to say archaeology, not archaeology, uh, genealogy. genealogy is. I mean, everybody's looking into their ancestors now, right? Finding sometimes terrible things. You find out your great grandfather was a bank robber or a mass murderer, but, uh, but nevertheless, you, you, people are interested in where they're from because we tend to be a rootless society and we need our roots to maintain a certain kind of psychological and philosophical and meaningfulness for our own lives. Take it away, Dan. <laughs> uh, so it's not, it's not necessarily that 
folks are disconnected. Of course, there you have beginning in the 1920s and the 30s when people from Central and Eastern Europe, uh, Poles, Jews, and other folks that were from Central and Eastern Europe uh, had to worry about the resurgent Ku Klux Klan and the anti-immigrant sentiment where under to save your life, to try to advance in a society which was rife with prejudice at the time, that people separated away from their ethnicity. And some of that still continues into the, the present day. But uh, think of the word Polishness. So as Dominic alluded to it, comes the Poles come from a region where people in na- neighboring villages of the same village will have different ideas of who's a Pole. Two people mm-hmm. who, you know, were their great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents have been living in Poland, and, and yet they'll say, well, no, no, people in that village, those aren't actual Poles because they speak a little different. And this is not true just of Poles, but all over. There's such a well-known adage, which I've heard it in Serbo-Croatian, I've heard it in Yiddish, I've heard it in Polish and Ukrainian, which goes along the lines, always made a little localized a bit, which says where... In this case, I'll say where two poles meet, you'll find three opinions. If you go to the Ukraine, it'll say, ah, where two Ukrainians meet, there are three hetmans. These are Ukrainian leaders. Um, You'll also hear where there are three rabbis, where where, where two Jews meet. And this comes from the fact that we come from a very um, part of the world where strong opinions are in vogue. And debating and yelling loudly doesn't mean you're angry at someone. It just means you're having an intellectual conversation. And so, or my dad. And so, uh, for myself, I'll joke. You know, I have a last name with twenty-seven consonants, right? Uh, you know, we have only twenty-six letters in the alphabet, but I know the intimidation that folks will see. And so, for example, one of my nicknames will literally be Polish Dan, um, <laughs> uh, because of the fact it begins with P, has something unpronounceable in the middle, and ends in ski. Polski, Polish Dan, right? Uh, it makes sense. But the idea of Poland and Polishness is different. And, and part of this has to do with, Dominic alluded to, the lack of fresh blood that comes in here. One of the things that I would talk about, and as anecdotal as this might be, I know about five or six people that um, came to Chicago, were foreign exchange students here, wanted to create a life here, and weren't able to. Whereas my own father, his brother was able to get, and this goes to show you how over time the, um, I guess the ease through which Poles could settle here changed. So whereas my father's brother was able to get a visa, uh, once he got married, his wife was unable to, which is why my cousins were raised Mm -hmm. in Poland, even though they had wanted to come here. And so uh, that has made it more difficult to bring, you could say, that fresh cohort, not only as Dominic alluded to, the fact that it's easier to go to Rome, but it's also become much more difficult to do that here. Nonetheless, in these Polish neighborhoods, such as in Avondale or in Pilsen, you've had the children of people who had moved out to the suburbs. Now, I've lived in the city all my life. I get to, I get to say that, exception of one year I was in Krakow, uh, like Dominic at the Jagiellon University, although he was a Fulbright scholar. I was just a, a young freshman, so can't compare those experiences. Um, but you have where, um, whether they're the children of Polish immigrants, whether they're the children of great grandparents who are Polish, who actually I've seen in the, uh, in the neighborhood of Avondale where people who will talk about, wow, my grandparents lived in this neighborhood or my great grandparents lived in this neighborhood where that awakens something within them to reconnect with Mm -hmm. their Polishness. Same thing I'm sure is true of folks in Wicker Park. And I believe, Dominic, you even have uh, some of that in your family as well, if I remember correctly. My daughter moved back to Pilsen, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, She lives right around the corner from St. Adelbert's, right? uh, It just shows you how the meaning of what it means to be Polish is constantly changing. There are no um, there are no definitions, and it gets back to having Polishness in your heart. And so, um, I actually remember how for for Poles who are so animated about um, what it means to be Polish to is to basically face hardship 
for being Polish or be willing to fight in some way, whether it's make a donation or just having a, a soft spot in your heart for that. Um, there is actually a Polish community in Haiti. These are folks who go back to the 1800s where uh, there were soldiers who um, were brought there by Napoleon, switched sides, and then ended up fighting for the Haitians in the Haitian Revolution. And um, here you had a situation where um, it's a documentary film. A friend of mine was involved in this, this very captivating documentary film. And he was actually the person who was the cameraman. And someone mentions in this village where they were of, of, of slight Polish descent. And when I say that, I mean that that cohort was small, but nonetheless, everyone in that village didn't matter if it was like, well, there was one person was my great grandmother who, who was the daughter of one of these Polish refugees. I'm Polish. And there's a seminal moment where they hear, oh, and I'm watching this film at the Polish Museum of America where it's being screened. And as everybody's watching it, they, they learn that the cameraman, these Haitians, Haitian Poles, that they are from Poland, that he's from Poland. And all of a sudden he says, gentlemen, everybody has to get up. And they all start clapping for him. And for all <laughs> folks in the audience, there was not a dry eye because for them, it doesn't matter if these folks had a, a very tenuous link to Polishness. They feel Polish. That to them is what it really means to, to be Polish. And that continues. <laughs> so we have one final question, which I think is going to be a fun one. Favorite Polish restaurant or bakery? My favorite Polish restaurant is Staropolska on Milwaukee Avenue in Jackowo in St. Hyacinth. That's my favorite. Uh, and uh, there's also uh, a place on the southwest side uh, in the Justice area, Justice, Illinois, called Sharotka, which is a Polish Highlander uh, restaurant that's excellent. How about you, Dan? Um, uh, so I'd say that with regards to, to Polish restaurants, it's like asking someone their favorite Beatles song. You can't say this is my favorite of all time. Uh, there's just different ones. And so there's so many great options like Smakos, uh, Podhalanka, uh, Helena, who's in there. She is like the Polish grandma you've always wanted. Um, uh, however, I've always had a soft spot for the Red Apple, which has amazing food. I actually got to go there with a French TV crew that came here to film the topic of Polish Chicago, which goes to show you, you know, there's not many cities where a film crew from Polish, La Chapelle Belle, uh, literally came in and they're like, no, no, we don't want to focus on the rest of Chicago. We just want to focus on Polish Chicago because that to us is just so interesting. And so um, uh, the Red Apple, it's a great restaurant. They had, they used to have two locations. One was in Avondale that closed because of gentrification. Um, however, the Nord Park location has been closed for COVID, but uh, according to the owner, as soon as we find a vaccine, they can't wait to be back in business. Well, now that we're all hungry for dinner, I guess we'll wrap up the event tonight. But I want to thank you all uh, for being here and for asking such wonderful questions in the uh, chat. I'm sorry we couldn't get to the, them all, but uh, this is a great conversation. Thank you so much to Dominic Vesiga and Dan Pogoshelski. And uh, I want to remind you that we have many, many events coming up at onebookonechicago.org. You can see some of our past events that are available for viewing on demand, including this one, which will be up shortly, uh, as well as upcoming events, including, I'll just mention a few, uh, we do have some genealogy workshops, if you're interested in that, as well as some cooking uh, events. And we also have a very special event coming up on Wednesday, uh, October 21st at 6 p.m. It's going to be a talk on the overlooked landmarks of Polish Chicago featuring none other than Dan Pogoshelski. So be sure you come back to this YouTube channel and tune in for that as well. Thank you guys so much for being here. It's just so fun uh, and happy Thank Polish you. Heritage Month. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>